word to you this morning is get ready, get ready. They get enough bullets in their life they from, plenty of from every direction you can think of. Anyway, this one's on direction. Yeah, it, it's used as a thing of hope, but the hope, what are we hoping for but here? We're talking bad about God. What is the rapture the most? It brings hope of no suffering on that day. Many argue that the books of Revelation offers a vision of God healing love and hope for the world. Read that again. A vision of God's healing, love and hope for the world. That, of course, comes with the rapture. So, how many of you are waiting on the rapture? For those that haven't experienced fundamentalism, the rapture notion goes like this. Jesus is coming back, and when he does, he will return before a time of something called the tribulation, before that starts. His calling up into the clouds with him those who are saved. Horrible suffering will then occur on the miserable earth for seven years. Then Jesus will have his third coming for a final judging. Wow, that's not how I saw it. When we get to the verses down here, where Jesus is going to meet us in the cloud, oh, there's got to uh, be a third coming if he come down here and did all this first. Uh, well, uh, okay? Yeah. And there's that tribulation thing and that seven years of misery to all those that didn't get called up. Yeah, starting with that. Catholics discount the idea completely. The truth is, the rapture concept is relatively new, and it only started in the 1830s. This is when an Anglo-Irish theologian invented the concept. This may come as a shocker to many, but that's fact. Before John Nelson Darby imagined a scenario in the clouds, no Christian had ever heard the word rapture, at least not used in this context. Along with Darby... Margaret MacDonald and Edward Irving were also involved. You see, Miss MacDonald had visions and charismatic utterings of the end times during services that were being presided over by Mr. Irving. Darby was a Scottish clergyman who had been removed from the Church of Scotland and presumably had been influenced by Irving's teachings. Darby later developed the ideas from the vision into the rapture, or at least into the theory that was later developed into the rapture. The idea was popularized by Cyrus Schofield, an American minister who published a famous reference Bible in 1908. He is the same one that developed the idea of an elaborate series of final periods in history known as dispensations. Schofield, like Darby, read the book of Revelation as a vision of the future, not of a fiery dream of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in A.D. 70. The rapture was popularized in the 1970s by Hal Lindsey's writings and the most recent in Tim LaHaye's Left Behind Books and Films. They are called positive entertainment that changes lives, inspires hearts, and lifts the spirits, although fictional. But the view remains. In fact, it is the most common interpretation of the book of Revelation by mainstream theologians. Here's the problem for the rapture-minded Christian. The word rapture itself doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible unless you're willing to think in broadly metaphorical terms. Rapture thinking is most often traced back to the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians where he writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we, who are left alive, will be snatched up with them on clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. It's important to note that Jesus himself never talked about the rapture. We read in Mark about the Son of Man coming in the clouds. But this is a reference back to the Old Testament book of Daniel, going the other way, up to meet the Ancient of Days. It's all metaphorical. In Mark, the oldest gospel, this passage 
is about the vindication of Jesus as he comes to heaven and is recognized as a true son of the Father. Whew, that's heavy. That's what it meant. In Luke 19, we read about a returning king. A close study of this passage suggests that Luke is talking about a God coming back to Jerusalem, not about Jesus returning to earth. And it's clear from looking carefully at everything Paul says about the future, as in 1 Corinthians or in Philippians, that he believes only that someday Christians will experience a kind of physical and spiritual change. They will be resurrected, but this is a complex term that suggests evolution, thorough transformation. In Thessalonians, Paul is writing like poet he is, creating a spectacular vision of a returning Lord who will be given a great reception in the air. Now the crucial word in the Revelant verse is meet. Those who are left alive will be caught up on clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The word meet in Greek is apentesis, and it meant to gather for a reception for visiting dignitaries. Now, even the idea of being snatched up is thoroughly inadequate for the Greek word harpazo, which is better translated as gathered. Paul is just being dramatic. He's imagining a holy reception committee that will greet the returning Christ. It's amazing how scriptures get misused in relatively new theological ideas, such as this, get deeply embedded in certain circles. The rapture is a plot device for popular entertainment and a bizarre theological teaching in fundamentalistic circles, where it functions in a variety of ways. Look, the only rapture taught in scripture is the resurrection of the righteous dead and the gathering of the living elect from the earth at Jesus' return, the end of this present world. Beyond this, any speculation about a rapture that would remove Christians and leave others behind is the result of a poor understanding of the scriptures. It may give millions hope, but it's still bad theology. I don't think an all-loving God would leave anyone behind to suffer if he could do such. I can't see God the Father being part of any kind of ending of the world. Well, not for punishment's sake anyway. For centuries, doomsayers have prophesied the apocalypse. And needless to say, none of these apocalyptic predictions have come true. Yeah, thank goodness we've lived through several. The pandemic may have felt apocalyptic, but it's not really out of the ordinary in historical terms. And despite all the recent heartbreak and insanity, humankind is still around and thriving. Still, there's no shortage of fresh end-of-the-world prophecies for the coming year. And the hope is, it won't happen to me. They're going to pull me out of this. It won't happen to me. But how selfish is that? It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to be snatched out of here. That's pious. Uh, you think?